Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our late breakfast talk on the European Green Deal this morning, organized jointly by Genshagen Foundation and the Institute Montaigne. Thank you for being with us in the coming hour. This debate takes place in the framework of the Genshagen Forum for Franco-German Dialogue, a format that we have been organizing jointly for 10 years with our French partner, Institute Montaigne. Um, exceptional conditions require flexibility to all of us and openness to new formats. Um, that's why we replaced, under the circumstances of the COVID-19 conditions, the annual conference concept of this Young Leaders format by a series of smaller modules, of which this breakfast talk today is one, as is the Franco-German publication series on the Green Deal that we completed recently with the Institut Montaigne and that is available on the websites of our both institutes. The Genshagen Forum has been focusing since last year on the lessons that we have learned or still need to learn from the COVID crisis. As we traditionally place current political issues in a broader thematic context in the forum, we are less interested in the concrete consequences for health management of the crisis, for example. Our focus is rather on questions such as European solidarity, European sovereignty, the relevance of a multi-level approach of the European governance involving Brussels as well as member states and regions, but also challenges for Europe and the EU to preserve social and economic cohesion within and between the member states in very difficult times when certain inequalities in our societies perhaps threaten to worsen. Um, COVID crisis revealed our fragility as human beings. So um, it is understandable that last year, public attention was very much focused on the immediate crisis management of the pandemic and the issue of climate protection seemed to fade into the background. But the situation is different right now. The slow decline of the pandemic, the radical change of the new US administration and climate policy but also concrete impulses such as the decision of the German Federal Constitutional Court in spring have led to the return of climate policy to the top of the political priority list, not only in Germany and France, but all over in Europe. Nevertheless, more than a year after the start of the pandemic, the European policy puzzle is no longer the same as it was in the beginning of 2020. Climate protection, economic recovery, and the need to guarantee cohesion in societies on the long run are overriding goals of national and European policy that cannot be separated from each other. This is a classic topic for the Genshagen Forum for Franco-German Dialogue. And we are very happy to have Pascal Confin with us this morning, the chairman of the European Parliament's Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety who has already contributed to our Green Deal publication series in which we analyze the social and economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic from different angles together with the Institut Montaigne this spring. Thank you, Pascal, to share with us this morning your views on the perspectives for a sustainable and just transition of the EU in the context of the Green Deal. My thanks also uh, go to Florence Schulz from the Berlin newspaper Der Tagesspiegel, who will kindly take over the discussion in the coming hour. Many thanks for that. But before we start, I'll pass on to my colleague Alexandre Robinet-Borgomano from our co-host this morning, the Institut Montaigne, to whom I would like to express my sincere thanks for the excellent cooperation as always. Alexandre, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. So my name is Alexandre robinet borgomano and the head of the Germany program at Institut Montaigne. Institut Montaigne is delighted to welcome you with the Genzagen Foundation for this inauguration webinar of the Genzagen Forum, which will take place in December. The, the Genzagen Forum uh, is the result of a historical cooperation of our both institutions, holding each year a platform of discussion on the central topic for the Franco-German dialogue in Europe involving decision makers, experts, think tankers and stakeholders from France and Germany. In view of the many challenges facing Europe, Germany and France have a special responsibility for the future of the EU and must work on developing common strategy. 
the Genzagen Forum actively support this process by promoting a result-oriented dialogue and networking of young leaders and experts from both countries. This year's forum is dedicated to the Green Deal and the definition of a new, more sustainable and resilient model of economic development. We launched a series of publications during the first sem semester of the year as a first step toward the forum, giving voice to different perspectives. We are delighted to hold this first webinar, examining the potential and limit of the EU's capacity to act as a climate policy actor in the context of the crisis, based on the impulse given by the author of the series. We are welcoming this morning Pascal Canfin, chair of the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, and Florence Schulz, climate and energy journalist working for Tagesspiegel background. Florence, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning. I hope you can see me. Mm -hmm. Welcome everyone to this talk. I'm very delighted to have been given the chance to be here. Uh, this is a breakfast talk, so we're going to keep it light and easy. And I hope you have a coffee, maybe a croissant. Um, I do. And um, so this is what's going to happen. Uh, we're going to have a talk, Monsieur Confin and me, for about 30 minutes. And then we're going to open up the round uh, for questions. So if you hear an interesting point uh, popping up, uh, please take notes and do pose them later. Um, I would ask you to then ask your questions in the Q&A. So please not in the chat, um, but yeah, in the Q&A. And you can also highlight questions that are particularly interesting. And I'll be reading them out. And we end on time at 11, so one quick hour. Um, I'm going to introduce our guest, uh, Monsieur Confin. Would you like to um, to turn on your camera, maybe? I'm doing it. Fine. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so I guess all of you know Monsieur Confin. Um, he has like a long career in um, environmental and um, development uh, politics. Is former Minister for Development, former Senior Advisor on Climate at the World Resources Institute, a former French uh, head of the French section of the WWF, and now obviously Chair of the Environmental Committee in the European Parliament, where he is very influential and part of the uh, Liberal Renew group, uh, group in the Parliament. Hello again. And I'll Hello. just... Um, <laughs> I'll jump right into the first question. Monsieur Confin, we're talking about um, paradigm, paradigm shift. shift. Ooh, I can hear myself double, but I hope. Uh, we're talking about the paradigm shift that the Green Deal means for the European economy. And in your paper that you wrote, you said that not everyone has quite realized yet what this means, what is to come. So I was wondering, can you tell me how would you define this paradigm shift and what is it going to mean on different levels? Okay, so I unmute myself. Uh, well, first, uh, obviously, thank you for your uh, this opportunity to have a, a discussion on this uh, topic. <clears throat> and I think it's very important that we uh, try to align uh, as much as possible our vision in, in France and Germany on uh, the, the Green Deal and, and the way we want to deliver on uh, the green transition. We have the exact same uh, goals, uh, climate neutrality 2050. Uh, we are uh, with uh, the same, more or less the same tools, uh, but uh, we still have to discuss in depth about uh, the, the, the package that will be delivered and proposed by the, the commission. And, and as we all know, when France and Germany agrees on something in Europe, it's not enough. But if we do not agree, it's more difficult to move forward big things. And that's exactly what happened with the recovery plan. That's exactly what should happen with the Green Deal. Um, so uh, the paradigm shift is that we are going to change in the next two years more than 50, 50 European laws. And it's unprecedented. I mean, we never changed it at, at this scale, with this magnitude, uh, at speed. Uh, so uh, when we, you change 50 laws at the same time, you enter uh, into a systemic change. 
because of course a lot of players will look at only uh, their silo so the car makers look at uh, cars uh, uh, energy uh, uh, provider look at the energy directives and so on and so on and so on but when you put all that all together then you have a new potential prosperity model and we are go going to play on a lot of uh, levers uh, that will to my view make a huge opportunity to invent in Europe in Europe this new uh, prosperity model up to uh, carbon uh, neutral uh, economy in 2050 and of course and in order to do so we need to do it in a in a way that we do not split uh, divide our societies but where we really transition and make it a just way so that there might be some questions around this but that's one key element and second element is we have to make it in a way that makes sure that our industries our companies as a whole but when we talk about carbon it's mainly about uh, key sectors like uh, energy industry uh, mobility uh, and food uh, make sure that we are able to uh, provide a framework that help them transitioning and not just killing them and putting them out of the market because for instance of having them to be forced to pay uh, a 50 60 euros 70 euros carbon price which makes a lot of sense from a climate perspective which is needed from a climate perspective but then if your competitor pays zero you are just put out of the market so that's why uh, being serious with climate as being serious with social justice and being serious with uh, uh, the uh, industrial base that's the triangle I mean, uh, uh, which is the core of the compromise and the way forward for the Green Deal in the EU. You already mentioned quite a few points in which we're going to dive a bit deeper in the moment. Um, obviously, it's quite a broad range of things we're talking about, but I was thinking, let's first start with what's going to happen soon. Uh, we're going to see the Fit for 55 package being uh, released by the European Commission in July. And one of the biggest things and possibly the game changer for the economy, obviously, is the reform of the ETS, the, the, the carbon trading system. Um, you already kind of gave an answer. I was about to ask you how high you think the carbon prices are going to get in the last years. You said 50, 60 euros onward. Um, they're already above 50, which is quite a game changer. Um, so now I'm wondering, how is the industry going to cope with those costs? And should we stick to the free allocation of certificates in your opinion? So I don't, I don't want to be uh, uh, too technical, of course, uh, but I think we should also address uh, real, real issues. So, uh, as I said, there will be 50 laws that will be changed uh, for the next two years. 13 out of it will be changed on the well, the change will be proposed uh, formally by the Commission on the 14th of July. I think it's unprecedented, unprecedented. I don't know any other package of that scale, 13 laws at the same time and not the, the, the smallest one. So uh, that's a very important moment uh, for the delivering of the Green Deal. Within this 13, you have the reform of the um, carbon market. So it's all, all, we always need to start with the systemic change and then focusing on one specific issue without losing the sense then the, that it is always part of a bigger and broader package. So the reform of the carbon market will pursue various objectives. The first one is, and the main one, is higher carbon price. So it's very clear, and that's why that's exactly what is anticipated by the market participants. Uh, and that's why the price is already between 50 and, uh, 50 and 55, because they, we all anticipate that the, the bandwidth, I would say, of the carbon price after the reform will be somewhere between 50 and 60 for the short-term period, and maybe up to 70 to 80 uh, for the second uh, period. Uh, of uh, the, the, the decade, I would say. And at that level of price, at that level of price, you start being, as you said, in the 
the space of where the business models change. With a carbon price of 20, you do not change anything. With a carbon price of 50, 60, 70, for coal, for energy system, for cement, for steel and so on, that's a massive difference. And there you have two issues. The first one is uh, on which scope do we apply this price? And that's the issue of free rentes. And then what about the competition between uh, these, our industries and others? On the for the first one, let's be serious. If we do not phase out progressively free allowances, we do not change. It's not a game changer because then, okay, you have a higher carbon price theoretically, but you just do not pay the price for real for massive part of your emissions because you have free allowances. So it's obvious that if we want to be serious with climate action, we have to progressively, I insist on the progressively, it's not a, a key phase effect, effect, it's not overnight, it's progressive, we, it's predictable, but it has to happen. I know that part of the industry is lobbying against it, yeah, it's obvious, but I must say that if you, are, if you are liberal, if you are in favor of innovation, if you are in favor of competition, you cannot create a sort of a free rider where 50, 60, 70 percent of your emissions are carbon free because it will kill innovation. So that's really backward looking and not uh, forward looking. So I'm completely against keeping as they are the free allowances, as I'm completely against killing them overnight. So then we need to draw the line and to decrease them. Second, if we decrease them, then that's a big game changer. And then a company and industry is, could fairly say, well, you asked me to pay for the carbon price. At the same time, you asked me to pay for green investment, for uh, zero carbon steel, for zero carbon cement, and I cannot do both, which is, which is true. So that's why I think we should connect the free allowances to the real investment of these companies covered by the ETS to the green technology. If you really invest in low carbon steel or low carbon cement, then you are doing what we want you to do. So at the same time, we are not going to ask you to pay for your carbon price at 60, obviously. So that's the way to navigate between just being too much conservative on this reform and on the contrary, uh, being uh, too uh, demanding on our companies. And the last remark from my side on the carbon market reform would be on the CBAM. And then I guess that you will discuss about the extension of the market a bit later on. So on, on, the, uh, on the CBAM, if we are serious with climate and serious with our industry, we need to have higher carbon price, progressive phase out of frequencies and carbon border adjustment mechanism. Because of course you cannot ask a cement company to compete with, or a steel company to compete with a, an Indian company or Chinese or Canadian or US or whatever company paying zero on carbon, zero on carbon. It's not possible. But to be fair with the US, we need to take into account not only the explicit carbon price, but also the implicit carbon price. Because the US are saying, and they are right to say, we are not going to put a carbon, a price on carbon, whether a market, through a market or whether through a tax. I think they should do it, but if they are not going to do it for political or domestic reasons, okay, it's their, their job. But the US say we are going to put standards in place. And of course, we should be able to take that into account in order not to uh, uh, penalize uh, uh, US companies exporting to the EU and having a sort of a double carbon price to be paid by them, which, by the way, wouldn't be WTO compatible. And the WTO compatibility is a key element of the CPAM because, as you know, the DNA of the EU is to be playing uh, within the uh, rules of multilateralism institutions, multilateralist institutions. So no way to have it something that would be a trade war. We have seen a first um, draft for the, the CBAM for the carbon border um, adjustment mechanism. 
And uh, it's basically going to be some sort of second ETS for companies outside of the EU that are gonna have to buy certificates and everything. This is more or less what we expected. But then of course the industry is worried. Uh, they do worry about trade tensions and their trade relations and the supply chain uh, chains. So what do you say to the industry? Um, is that really, is the CBAM really going to create a level playing field? Is that sufficient to prevent carbon leakage? Um, is it right that they might have to worry in at least a transition phase that things might stir up a bit? And maybe connected to this, how can we, you, you mentioned this, how can we try not to harm our trade relations on the global scale with China and the US because so far, we don't have any carbon corporations. So uh, the question of uh, managing well the transition is key. And then you have two extremes that we should avoid. The first extreme would be, I would say, the going too far, uh, too, too fast, and killing the free allowances short term and having a CBAM that will not protect our companies the same way that free allowances do. To have, at the end of the day, not protectionism, but just fair competition. So just not having to pay something more than the others. I, I'm fully on that line. I do not want to kill overnight the, 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 the free allowances. But there is another extreme which would say, well, do not touch at all the free allowances. And then the CBAM is, of course, a, almost an empty shell. Because there is no CBAM if there is no decrease of free, free allowances, because then there is no carbon leakage. Okay, So between these two extremes, we should draw the middle ground line, which is, OK, we phase out, we phase out free allowances progressively, and we phase in uh, CBAM at the same time. And we start with some sector and so on and so on. And progressively, we design this. It will take, so the, the decision will take uh, one year, but the, the, the entry into force will take more years. But we know where we want to, 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 to land. Regarding our partners, as I said, the US, I mean, don't, don't forget that uh, the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism is in the Biden platform. But of course, the US had China in mind. But it's not possible for the US to be strongly opposed to something that they are promoting for themselves regarding China. So that's why Kerry, when he went to Europe, said, well, I'm not against, I just have questions. And actually, they have questions, and we have the same questions. Because again, we do not want to enter into a trade war with anybody. We just want to design something that will have, make sure that we have a fair competition. Because today, the risk of uh, having a carbon price of 50, 60, 70, no CBAM, and a phasing out of free allowances is that we expose our companies not to protectionism, but we expose the company to the opposite of protectionism, which is that we put much more burden on them than on their competitor. So I don't have the keyword for the opposite of protectionism, but that's exactly the risk we face. So, Let's be transparent with our partners. That's what we should be doing. And actually, that's what we are doing with the US, saying, why are we doing so? Uh, please do, do the job yourself. So either you put the equivalent of uh, 50, 60 euros per ton. If you don't, please st put standards in place, and then we will compare. And if we are uh, in a sort of carbon club, uh, it's a it's an idea coming from Germany, and it's an idea I like. If we are in more or less the same space, then let's forget about the CBAM with you, for sure, for sure. But if there is no price and no standard, like Turkey, like Morocco, uh, well, uh, I'm sorry, but we cannot accept to have unfair competition on sp very specific industries where you can see, for instance, in Ukraine, or you can see already uh, cement uh, plant being built, not for the domestic market at all, but just to export to the EU, because they are just around the, uh, the, the other side of the, the border with Poland. And then that's something we cannot uh, sell to our citizens uh, and we cannot accept from a political perspective. So that's why the right balance is there. 
And then regarding the extension of the ETS, but then we could also discuss other issues than, than the ETS regarding the extension of the ETS. I'm quite, I'm, I'm quite worried, to be honest. I'm quite worried. Uh, why? I'll tell you my analysis. I'm, I, I don't have here my uh, parliament hat uh, or my NV committee hat or even the French hat. I'm talking here with my own, in my own capacity. Uh, even if I know that France is very skeptical about the extension of BTS, but I don't want to uh, prejudge what would be the, the, uh, the official line of the government. Uh, the carbon prices pricing makes a lot of sense for companies, even for big companies, I would say, because they really compare, uh, they are rational, economically rational. So they really compare the cost of their investment, the profitability, the technology A versus the technology B and so on. That's the mindset they are in. So if you put a carbon price, a significant carbon price, then you have a real effect of shift on investment patterns and so on. But if you take the average family, including you, including me, how, do, how, many, how much time do I spend to really calculate the investment return of one spend, one investment uh, for in my home or when I buy a car, the exact calculation of the uh, uh, cost over the next 10 years. Nobody does that. Nobody. Nobody. It's not even the poorest. I mean, nobody does that. And if you add the fact that at the end of the day, some citizens cannot afford paying more because the point for them is not to decrease their energy bill or their energy, uh, but it would be to go on, on, the, on, on, on the opposite, to be able to have enough heat in the winter because they are, uh, too, they are energy poor. Putting a price on carbon for them is politically irrelevant and from a climate and an economic perspective, irrelevant. And if I take my French hat for a second, we have the yellow jackets for a very small increase. And now in Germany, that's why the debate in Germany is very interesting. In the pre, uh, in the electoral campaign, if I put it bluntly because I'm not German, CDU and SPD and others, they have finally found the anti grunen weapon, which is exactly this one. Oh, you want to put a higher carbon on uh, uh, a price on carbon, on fuel, on bills, uh, it will cost blah, 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 blah. We know the story. Look at the consequences in the put. And you want the EU to do the same? Uh, so uh, I'm very, very, very skeptical not to say more uh, about this extension. And then, but to end up there, then that's where we need to find a Franco-German deal. Mm. And of course, uh, we have to wait for the results of the uh, German election uh, to have this deal. Uh, because I know that France is very skeptical on this part of the reform. I know that Germany is skeptical on the CIBAM. So the deal last year between Macron and Merkel was to say, okay, Germany does support the CIBAM, France does support the extension, full stop. Or at least we do nothing to kill each other. Fine. But then uh, we need to make sure that it works for real. And then we are just not creating a monster with the extension of the ETS. That would be very costly from a political perspective, including, and then I take my French hat again, including uh, a, form, a few months before the French presidential election where we know that uh, it's not a given that Marie Le Pen will not be elected. Could you imagine something, imagine something solution that we're debating in Germany right now, um, since we, we have introduced this carbon market for the transport and building sector at the beginning of the year, and we know the carbon prices are going to go up. Uh, we are having this big debate about a direct recompensation for people, for citizens, and then there are different models, and the question is, how to give the money back, what's most efficient. Let's suppose we do this on an EU level, and I just heard you're very critical about this. Could you imagine to introduce such a model that every citizen gets a certain amount of money back as uh, Switzerland already does, or would you see any other solution to this? 
no why, why not but you know if you it's a bit absurd to put a price on carbon for everybody and then reimbursing the very same price on carbon for half of the population just inject money into the shift for technology for technologies for instance uh, I, I give you an example well is it about the which for, money sorry, I'm sorry. And, and then the problem is that so it it might be an option okay it might be an option obviously but then you have because it's at the european level it's more complex to operate because the resources will be made at the european level the fund and then you create a problem that is not existing today and you uh, uh, then uh, ask the member states to solve it if there is a smooth and simple way to do it that's the that's may I, I will look at it very carefully but what i want to avoid is something that will reinforce uh, the uh, increase on uh, bills i don't know six months later okay or one year later because then that will create the very same frustration from part of the society uh, that will just say well i don't want to pay now even if you pay me back uh, in six months time because i don't have the capacity to wait for the six months so we will see what the, the commission will propose but of course i can tell you that i'm skeptical a lot of countries are skeptical a lot of political me of members in the european parliament are, spe are skeptical and the only way the only way to get a majority around this would be for the commission to be very, very straightforward, very clear on something that will work to, hand, to, to, to handle the social consequences of that. If it's something which is uh, not working, not convincing and so on, I don't see any majority uh, in the parliament. I don't want to prejudge for the council, but probably the same. Well, we'll see the details in July. Um, I'm sure it's gonna get quite complicated as we see in Germany right now. But yeah, let's let's see what proposals are going to come. And, and the risk is that you know the the all the studies, all the studies. Uh, let's take the transport uh, sector. All the studies have demonstrated many, many, many times that the main, by far, the main driver for CO two cuts is the standard on engine, and that's part of the thirteen directives uh, package of July. And that's where the commission is, uh, has to be uh, uh, clear and consistent and propose a new standards for 2030 and 2035 that will lead to a major shift, major shift into electric mobility. And my, uh, again, my, uh, my position here is the same than uh, a lot of uh, players that 2030 is too early for the industry. I mean, we, we cannot make it. We just cannot make it from, from a purely material perspective. I'm so going to go exactly to this point in a minute. It's just you taking ahead a point that I wanted to ask you anyway. Um, we have 10 minutes left, and I want to talk exactly about this, um, the how do we um, start the right investments. Um, one thing first, please, the, um, the viewers can start asking questions in the chat. So if you already have something uh, in the Q&A, of course, not in the chat, please, in the Q&A. And yeah, exactly, Mr. Confin, you just said also it's a, it's a time issue now. We have like very long investment cycles in the industry when we think of um, the steel and chemistry industry, for example, half of the plant will have to be renewed uh, in the next decade. And I mean, obviously a lot of companies do have their climate plans and everything, but there's a big, big lack of uncertainty. So how do we give them the certainty that they need to make the investments um, and do they have enough time? Yeah. Uh, so uh, there are uh, various answers to that. Uh, not either or, but uh, in addition. First, I'm a big advocate of sectorial roadmaps meaning that we need to agree on the vision of the next decades being technology neutral okay but saying okay you are saying as an industry that you need this we should be able to provide you this but at the same time 
you said that you are able to invest in uh, XYZ technology. So please make sure that you invest and we need to look at if you are investing on. So you put the private side and the public side together and you designed a common way and you overcome all the, uh, the challenges and the, the, the obstacles. And you design policies that are consistent. Exactly what I said earlier on the ETS reform. If a company, chemical company, invests in uh, uh, zero carbon uh, chemistry and it requires a 1 billion investment for this company, at the same time, we are not going to ask this company to pay 60 euros carbon price for the very same investment. But you know, the, the investment will take time to produce effects on the carbon emissions. But the, the, the decision to invest has to be put in a context for the next X years. So that's why we need to make sure that we design a policy framework that allow this company to invest this billion, making sure that they really do it, really do it. If they don't do it, they have to pay their carbon price. But if they do it, we are not going at the same time to ask them to pay for the carbon price. So that's the kind of balance, to my view, which is the good balance, because if you do not, it's, it's a small or less an act or pay system, or you act and you invest, and it's exactly what we want you to, to do, or you pay. And for, to, for investment, to, to unlock investment, we need the right policy tools in place. And my analysis today, is to say that the key word is here is the risking. We are in a world of in a world sorry of low interest rate. So the the, the cost of money is low. Uh, subsidizing and, and, and big big companies can uh, can access mar capital markets loans almost uh, this way. The, the point is not subsidizing the cost of money, okay? The point is the risking. Who is, take, who is bearing the risk? Which part of the risk is on the shoulders of private side? Which part of the risk is on the shoulder of public side? To my view, it's the key discussion. But at this point, mm -hmm. ask, could you imagine something like carbon contracts for difference that would exactly... Exactly. To exactly. That's, that's exactly the way I, I wanted to learn. So, mm -hmm. One tool, there are many tools to the risk, but one tool, and I think it's a good one, is a carbon contract for difference. Because then you use this tool only if there is an investment. I mean, if there is no investment, there is no guarantee, so full stop. So you do not lose your money. I mean, from a taxpayer perspective, it's, it, it, it's an efficient tool. And you provide predictability for the private company because you, you make sure that if ever something wrong happens, you will deliver on the, this part of risk. And at the same time, you can negotiate the, the price for the contract for difference, very specific to the sector, even very specific to the company. So, I mean, that's the problem of the carbon market, that it delivers the very same price for all the sectors. But a 50 euros per ton in chemical industry is not the same story that in cement, which is not the same story for, for coal. So a contract for difference allows more flexibility, sectorial flexibilities. So if you have the sectorial roadmap, plus the connection between the ETS and the investment, plus the contract for difference, to my view, you have the toolkits which allow us to be very consistent, ambitious on climate, delivering on climate target, and making sure that we have a smart uh, design of public policies for, for, for the company's concern. And Sweden has something which I like very much, which, which is called uh, Fossil Free Sweden. It's a sort of public-private body uh, spotting everything which is necessary to unlock, to overcome, to change, blah, blah, to make sure that Sweden will be fossil free in a short, quite short term, Sweden's 2035 or 40. So that's interesting. I think we should have that kind of uh, thinking at the European level as well. Um, one last question before we go into the... Uh, and I, sorry, I didn't answer you on the car. Yeah. <laughs> so just, just one sentence, because yeah. that car industry, I mean, you cannot imagine a, a car industry reform without Germany. 
So 2030 is too early, too early. 20, so you can have uh, market countries like Netherlands saying 2030 is fine. It's fine from a market perspective, but it's not fine from a production perspective to have the whole production shifted in so much, so little time. So 2030, it's too early. 2040 is too late from a climate perspective. So the, 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 obviously the common ground and the landing zone should be 2035. And I'm very much happy to see that the European car uh, makers uh, association, so let's say lobby, uh, is saying now publicly that they can live with 2035 for real. So uh, that's why that's a massive shift. And uh, Germany was quite reluctant to do so five years ago still. But now we, you know that you are going to be among the winners of that because you have the technology now. So that's why uh, this plus the new uh, climate German targets uh, after the, the, the court decision will lead us to a 2035 compromise, which I think is a very good compromise. One last question. We're running a bit out of time because we have quite a few questions um, from the audience that I would like to ask you. Um, my last question is, um, obviously, as you said, there are differences between the different member states' industries. Um, what role do France and Germany play? And how, I mean, we're not facing the same challenges as countries like Poland. How do we make sure that we don't leave certain member states behind? I would ask you for a short answer, maybe two minutes maximum, so we can move on to the other questions. No, I mean, we, that's what I said at the beginning, the, the, the just transition, sorry, the just dimension of the transition is key. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a climate consistency, uh, industrial uh, concern. We need to address the, the, the concern of the industrial base and uh, climate, uh, uh, sorry, uh, just transition. When I say just transition is for, uh, also for countries. And my first uh, trip as a chair of the NV committee in the parliament was to Poland, was to Warsaw, precisely to have a much better understanding of what is happening there. And I must say that I fully acknowledge, fully acknowledge that they have a different starting point and they are not responsible for the starting point. It came from the allocation of energy sources in the Soviet era. So they are not responsible for that. So we need to be uh, clear that we have to put the necessary money on the table to make them shift. And that's the good deal. And actually now, Poland is not blocking anymore the climate target. They are shifting because, I mean, the, the good, the dynamic compromise is on its way. And by the way, uh, uh, the carbon price reform will make a big difference also for Poland. Uh, because it will uh, make coal even less competitive than today. Uh, so if we have to take care about this. And, and it's not only a German concern. I mean, it's, it's a concern that is shared by France as well. I can tell you. Thank you. Um, we have a question about the energy performance in buildings directive. So um, there is a ban um, planned on oil and gas heating systems. Is that the way to go? The sorry, the question is what asked by uh, Hugo Sancho. Okay, so the, the, well, the, the key issue for the reform of the performance of buildings to me uh, is uh, to shift from the, the flow to the stock. For the European framework, legal framework, is targeting today only the flow of new buildings which is good, but we all know that the key, the core of the discussion is the stock of the buildings, not the new ones. The new ones are fine, but it will take one century <laughs> to replace the stock. So we have to speed up uh, the, the retrofitting of the stock. And that's where the commission said, well, for the first time, and it's a good thing, that they will put a European law on this in, in, with the review of the performance standard for buildings. And then we are going to have at the European level all the debate, political debates we had at the national level. And we had still one ongoing in France with the French climate law, and we probably had one in Germany on this very same topic. So we will see what will be the added value of the European legal framework on this. So I do not want to prejudge if it's good to ban one technology or another one, so to set the right level of performance or to phasing it. We will see. 
But as a principle, having a European framework, legal framework, uh, and I would say mandatory framework, otherwise it's just, a, just a, it's just blah, blah, mandatory framework to make sure that states deliver on the spinning up of the refurbishing of the stock of the buildings is a key element of the green deal. Um, we have another question from Thoma Pellerin Carlin um, about something we already talked about. Um, so like in Germany, we have, as I said, this new carbon market for uh, the buildings and heating uh, sectors. And so the money that we um, make through this is at the moment flowing into a reduction of the um, electricity prices. Yes. So basically there's a divide, how to um, redistribute the money. Shall we just, as we said, give like a direct uh, recompensation or do it indirectly through electricity uh, price reduction? What is your view on this? Would this make sense? Uh, from, uh, well, uh, as I said, uh, I think that the carbon pricing, whether it's a market or a tax, because I think in Germany and at least short term it's more tax than a market, uh, is not the most appropriate tool mm. for ordinary citizens. It is for companies because they are economically rational. We are not economically rational. I mean, we never, we, we never calculate, as I said, the economic rationality of an, any spending or investment over the next five years. We, we don't know, never, nobody does that. So that's why I don't think the carbon pricing route is the best way. And it is probably the, politically speaking, the most costly, which is exactly what happened in France uh, two years ago. My good feeling is that it's exactly what is happening in Germany today and what might happen in the EU if we do not deprive. So that's why I'm very, very, very cautious. So then uh, once you are cautious as a principle, then uh, I don't want to enter into the, the details of what could be done, because I think that whatever you do at the end of the day, it's, it's probably more counterproductive than uh, uh, helping uh, climate action. Thank you. We have one last question from Martin uh, Stavenhagen. Um, I'm not sure if I know exactly what he means. He said, what does the European Green Deal mean for the EU energy and climate strategy? Are there any adjustments necessary or planned? I guess maybe if you could just reframe a bit what, what the biggest changes are going to be in the Fit for 55 package, because that is really the core of the Green Deal, right? Well, the, the, so uh, in terms of uh, rules or in terms of impact, because in terms of rules, of course, for the energy sector, you have first the carbon market for the uh, power generation. So with a price of 50 to 60 euros per ton, to be honest, the competitiveness of coal, and that's a big issue for Germany as well, mm. is close to zero or even less than zero. So it should accelerate the phasing out of coal in Germany. That's one of the key goals, to be honest, of the reform or the key impact of the reform. So it's very clear that we should go, Germany should go faster than what is uh, expected today. Uh, second, uh, it's going to give a boost to renewables because we are going to uh, increase the minimum standard or the minimum target, probably let's say around 40% for renewables in 2030, it's 40% of the total energy consumption. No? It's not 40% of the electricity, so it's massive. Uh, and uh, if we do these two rights, <laughs> that's very, that's good. Then we have the electricity, the, 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 sorry, the electrification of mobility, which is of course also a key element in terms of energy because you moved from fossil based, let's say oil, to electricity. And when you move to electricity, you can move to coal, which would be absurd because if you move a car electric uh, powered by coal, the gain is very, very limited, close to zero or sometimes even minus than zero. So no, no climate rationality behind. But if you go to uh, uh, electrification of mobility and uh, zero carbon uh, emissions, then you have, uh, in terms of power generation, then you have the, 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 the good ecosystem. And the fact that we do it together, that's, that's why we should have closed. The, the, the big thing is 
closing coal power station when we go for full electrification of mobility. Okay, that, that makes sense. And the right date for that is mid, the, 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 the let's say 2035. Okay, so it's not one year, one specific year, but it's the, the, the landing zone to have this big shift is 2035. That's the macro, I would say, picture for the energy. And then between France and Germany, you have always this nuclear debate. Uh, we will have this, again, this debate uh, within the taxonomy framework, and uh, we could spend uh, one hour on this. So I'm not going to open it, but we should, of course, uh, have it in mind. Um, one very last question from the audience, and then I guess we're going to end this. Lara Schmidt is asking if the EU should lower the legal uh, requirements for environmental protection uh, in order to boost the European energy transition. In Germany, you know, we've had we have this very complex law, EEG, which is posing a lot of problems in the energy transition. A lot of obstacles are there. Should we make this easier on the European level? Uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't get the, the question. Um, whether the EU should basically simplify and lower standards and rules to uh, boost the energy transition. Okay, so uh, lower standard for, for, for what, for uh, uh, impact studies or things like that? I assume that she just means, um, yeah, she said, for example, for environmental impact assessment. Yeah, that's, that's the, okay. That well, it's, it's mainly national. I mean, the environmental impact studies are led by, by uh, national laws. And uh, I don't have a strong view on what should be changed on, on that front, to be, to be, to be honest. Mm. Okay, well, I guess uh, that was, yep, that was all of the questions and we're just in time. Uh, there are so many other things we could have talked about, but an hour is not enough to talk about the European economy. I do thank you very much, Monsieur Confin. Thank you. Um, and thank you. Uh, thank and uh, you. have a good day. You too, you too. Have a lovely afternoon. And thank you also to our audience um, for the questions that you asked. Um, thank you on behalf of the uh, Gentang Foundation and Institut Montaigne. And uh, there's going to be a big closing um, uh, conference in December on the German-French um, um, dialogue. Uh, you're going to get more information on this uh, soon. And um, yes, thank you to everyone. Have a lovely day.